So here's a bit of a lecture for 2021. It's basically unfinished work. So this is a lecture about going full circle, which is a kind of recurring theme in my life. Um, grew up in Pittsburgh. It was inspired by Andy Warhol and music by the Velvet Underground. And early on as a kid, I learned about uh, the Czech president, Václav Havel, from a book I found in a thrift store. And basically the cultural revolution over there, known as the Velvet Revolution, where some rock bands were just pursuing what they wanted, which was music, and they were banned and thrown in prison. And one guy was fighting basically for basic freedoms in that country. And it was something that inspired me. And many years later, I ended up traveling to Czech Republic, donating a large Tesla coil, was recognized by President Havel, and ended up meeting and befriending all of these band members from that I learned about 10 years prior. And um, it's a strange example in life of, of pursuing something that doesn't necessarily make sense but somehow things work out and uh, that ends up being a lot of fun along the way. So early on, I was inspired by these guys, Jim Hardesty on the left and Bill Wysock on the right. Now, Jim had a company, PV Scientific, and he was selling static machines, induction coils, Crooks tubes. And Bill, he was making the largest Tesla coils in the world. Now, as a teenager, I had no idea that these two men knew each other. So I reached out to both of them looking for a job because it became obvious that this kind of field of, of Tesla coiling and, and antique science was a lot more fun than typical jobs of being a machinist, which is what I was doing in the early days. And so both of these men inspired me to open a museum, but they also encouraged me to open a museum. And it was an important part of life that these two gave me support instead of discouragement. Uh, this lecture is dedicated to Jim Hardesty on the right. Uh, on the left is our good friend, Graham Fulkus. Uh, here they're standing at Wardenclyffe, this, in front of the Stanford White Building, which was Tesla's lab in Shoreham. And uh, Jim unfortunately passed away recently. Uh, came as a huge shock. Uh, he was an incredible man, incredible craftsman, uh, amazing historian. And like many of us, he was working towards bringing more truth into all of these subjects that we're studying today. And so much of this lecture is apparatus that's near and dear to him and his quest throughout life. There are other people to mention along the way. Harry Goldman of Tesla Coil Builders Association passed away a few years ago. Uh, an amazing man. He documented a lot of Tesla history before the internet and uh, played a huge role in educating the public on a topic that was very not very little known during that time period. Both of these men are alive and well. On the left is Lutz Neumann. On the right is Wolfgang Lynchmann. And they're both glass blowers in Germany, in Kursdorf area. And they are the last of their kind. They're making Crooks and Geisler tubes today. Uh, Wolfgang, not so much. Uh, he, I think he's, he's kind of retired, but Lutz is carrying on the job, and he's literally the last of his kind. Another important person to mention is Frank Jones. He was my competitor for many years, buying things on eBay until we met and became friends. And uh, he's been one of my closest friends and allies uh, he's collected so much history and given his whole life to preserving parts of history that otherwise would have been forgotten. 
Frank is also alive and well and living in Idaho. And unfortunately, within the last year, a uh, very good friend, Bill Turbo, very important friend, he was the last blood relative of Nikola Tesla. He was Tesla's nephew's son. And we met around 2002, 2003, somewhere along there. And we were in constant contact ever since. I have an electrical museum in South Florida. It's been in different locations in Palm Beach over the years. It's currently at RGF Environmental Group, where I work. And it's a small part of my collection. The rest of my collection is in the Las Vegas area. And another very good friend of mine, John Griswatch, is trying to open a Tesla museum uh, in that area. And he has a lot of history, in particular mine, Bill Wysox, some of Harry Goldman's, some of Frank Jones. It's all priceless history regarding Nikola Tesla and the people who were inspired by him and made inventions along the lines of uh, the work he did. And whether it was electrotherapy or high voltage uh, early scientific instruments and technologies, uh, all of that stuff is part of his collection. Uh, in my museum, there's a lot of Tesla lamps that I made. I purchased a, a local neon sign shop from a friend, Beck Osborne, and have been learning the art of glass blowing and lamp making and trying to replicate some of Tesla's lamps that he used in his early lectures. The museum also contains over 6,000 blueprints, uh, many from a company, H.G. Fisher, that was an early medical company that lasted until the 90s. And unlike everyone else, they didn't put a bunch of eccentric claims with their pieces. And they sold many Tesla coils over the years. And in the x-ray industry, we've gone full circle there as well. Most modern x-ray machines use high frequency transformers. The museum, you can see some of the blueprints on the back wall, uh, contains a lot of unique machines. Uh, on the left is a 10 kilowatt x-ray from 1907 from uh, Snook, who was the inventor. And uh, it made instantaneous x-rays at a time where it might have taken 15 minutes to do a chest x-ray. You could do it with this machine in 200th of a second. There are also many Tesla coils. Uh, you can see on the table, there's an early type of oil-filled lecture coil. There's a portable Tesla coil next to it. There's one that I made that makes a meter arc. And there's McIntosh Hogan that was famous in the Frankenstein films. Uh, it was actually an early electrotherapeutic cabinet. And next to it's a capacitor from Kenneth Strickfadden. We have a lot of rare documents, uh, including uh, original obituary of Nikola Tesla, announcement of a biography by John O'Neill. Uh, these were both folded up in a, a very special book that was Tesla's experiments with alternate currents. Uh, I have a first edition of that lecture. And uh, it's a very rare book to find first editions of. There was a time that you couldn't get a copy for less than $3,500. Um, now I, I've, I've not seen an original for sale in, in over a decade. But uh, it's important to try and, and get as much of these original articles and books as possible just because we don't, we don't want to have to rely on low quality internet images forever. And part of what I'm doing is scanning all of these books very high resolution in color and making them free to the public. Uh, we also have an original stopper lamp, thanks to Frank, from uh, the Columbia Exposition, 1893. Of course, this is from the battle of the currents between Tesla and Edison, how they were going to light the exposition with AC or DC. 
uh, Westinghouse one, but Edison wasn't about to sell them any lamps, so they had to come up with something that didn't interfere with Edison's patent, and this was the solution. Uh, have the oldest induction coil, uh, largest spark induction coil, and oldest in the U.S. from Edward Ritchie. And uh, Ritchie was a uh, winner in a comp competition back who could make the long longest spark, basically, because Ramkorf, his coils were designed with flat wound, uh, or rather helical wound coils, and they were prone to breaking down. Ritchie's solution was to make the coils in sections that were pancake shaped. Uh, we also have early alternating current meters from Westinghouse. Uh, these were originally in Pittsburgh. Since that time period, they were in the uh, Washington Jefferson College and saved them a few years ago. We have original speedometers of Nikola Tesla and a lot of paperwork associated with them. Uh, the story is quite interesting because Tesla actually stole the design from an inventor from Iowa that's little known named Steed Asquith. And Asquith invented the speedometer originally, but it was very similar to Tesla's turbine. And so Tesla intervened and he ended up patenting his own version of the speedometer with Waltham Watch. However, the commercial version was actually Steed's design, and they both split the commission, something that the Asquith family has resented for many years. And I'm just happy to get the story out, even though I'm not happy to tell the story, it's still history, and you have to, uh, sometimes you learn things you'd rather you not know about people you admire, inventors you admire, but that's the case. Uh, the last coil was one I built for uh, John Griswatch. It was a 12-foot-tall Tesla coil. This is the one in my museum currently. Uh, I've built many hundreds of Tesla coils. Uh, I typically focus on the tabletop models, but uh, I've built some, some of the larger ones as well. This next coil showing a flaming discharge was a typical example of a Tesla X-ray coil. This one was made by James Seeley of Los Angeles around 1907. It was a beautiful example of engineering and what inspired me to get into winding the pancake style of Tesla coils. In the museum, we have a special archive dedicated to Thomas Burton Kinraid. Uh, he was a fairly unknown inventor today, but he was very prolific back at the turn of the century. Uh, he patented a form of Tesla coil in 1897, around the time Tesla was patenting his circuit controllers. Uh, he was inspired by Tesla's work and ended up developing the first practical portable x-ray uh, he was also very prolific in photographing electricity. And in 2004, I found his home, which was in Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts, and there were hidden rooms beneath the house where I, I found passages that led to coils I read about when I first started collecting. Uh, the high-frequency pioneer Frederick Finch Strong uh, first witnessed x-rays at Kinraid's house. And Strong went on to develop the first therapeutic Tesla coils back in 1896. Uh, Kinraid's uh, electrographs of sparks, which some of them can be seen here, I have them on 8x10, 11x14 glass plate negatives. Uh, hundreds of them, incidentally. Uh, they are very intriguing in that there are many spark forms that you'd hear about in Tesla lectures, but you never actually see photos of. And Kinraid took the time to do all of that, and there's a lot of new information we learned in recent years about these photographs. These are some of the original Tesla coils that I found in his home. Uh, they're of the pancake variety, and they came about in the same reason that 
Nikola Tesla and Elihu Thompson and others were trying to develop a new style of coil that used less wire because the Ritchie coil and the induction coils, Rumkoff coils, could have used anywhere from 5 to 20 miles of wire to make these sparks. And here you see an example of one that was disassembled by Kinraid. And he got this idea if you just took small sections of this coil, which were flat spirals, and you pulse them with a high frequency, that you could save on wire in making these coils. And the initial coil he made, which I have fragments of, was actually operated under oil, uh, much like the ones outlined in Tesla's 1893 lecture, uh, a form of pancake coil, multiple sections under oil. Uh, I found it in 2010 visiting Kinraid's home for a second time, and it was actually found in the back of a toilet tank which in, th in those days was a, a oak box lined with copper. And in Tesla's lecture, he called out an oak box lined with zinc, basically as some metal you could solder and keep it oil tight. Uh, we have things in the museum. This is a, a single wire Tesla lamp. And this one was made by Lutz Neumann. Uh, shows the value of Lutz because he, he's able to replicate something that no one else can but it shows you the beauty of the style of lamps Tesla was making in 1890s, even though they made x-rays. This next photo, uh, a tube now in the possession of Kelly McJilton, was a single wire Tesla lamp from Europe, an extremely rare tube. You can see it operating here, and you can see by molecular bombardment, as Tesla called it, the filaments lighting up. It's actually focused x-rays that's making that filament light, and you can tell by the green glow on the glass. Part of the work I'm doing now is research in the high frequency and new applications for old ideas. And here you see some glass plate capacitors. Uh, in the past, I invented a type of novel tuning capacitor to be able to operate early Tesla coils when you didn't know the exact geometry or wire configuration that they had internally. Over the years, we've documented a lot of curious sparks and phenomena associated with Tesla coils outside of the typical realm that people were experimenting with. Uh, these are the effluves and corona discharges. They're produced very easily by the pancake style of Tesla coil when you limit the number of windings in them. Now there's a modification of this coil where you change the electrical circuit a little bit and you can end up getting fractalized image forms which you see in the air here, they're very faint, but they end up forming Lichtenberg figures in the air. And the polarities can change from positive to negative to various mixed polarities in the air right in front of your eyes just by carefully manipulating the electrical circuits. And with a well-made circuit, you can see here how beautiful the positive discharges are. These are over a foot long from the coil and a half inch thick and the coil's consuming less than 20 watts of power. The interesting thing about these discharges, they mimic very much what you see in sprites and certain forms of upper atmospheric lightning. In this next photo, you can see by adjusting the spark gap of this apparatus, just a few ten thousandths of an inch, the polarity starts to change from positive to negative, and it explains the unusual geometry uh, going from fractalized tree branches, kind of like a, a fern-like image, into something more plumous, which is a negative electricity, which is more like a feather type of shape. We also documented over the years uh, things like sparks that repel each other after seeing a lot of uh, kind of ridiculous free energy demonstrations at certain conferences, um, 
have to remind people sometimes of the basic physics of things. Uh, you can make a bipolar coil where the sparks repel each other simply by making the same sign spark on either end of the coil. There are other things we documented uh, by adding various capacities to the circuit. You can get unusual sparks where they're brighter in the middle or along the path of the sparks. In static electricity, typically the negative pole of, of the spark is whiter and the positive pole is more violet or purple. Uh, in these sparks, there's, there's a quite a bit of mixed polarity involved. We also documented lots of flaming discharges because most Tesla coils today, they're built on certain rules of thumb where there's limited current actually in the output of the sparks. In the early days, they were using lower voltages, higher currents to drive the coils. And the result were these twisting, hot, flaming discharges. We also did a lot of experimentation over the years, uh, running Tesla coils with as high as 100 kV for the power supply, or as low as 240 volts, yet still maintaining the basic spark gap capacitor circuits. Uh, the coil in the upper left is a modification of the Poulsen arc, where it's uh, being driven by a carbon arc with a strong magnetic field at perpendicular to the arc. We also did some experimentation where you superimpose low and high frequencies on top of each other in the same apparatus. And the result is very similar to what happens in the modern TIG welding machines, where you have a high frequency and a low frequency combined. We also did some work over the years uh, mimicking static electricity with Tesla coils. And it's basically by changing some of the main values of the circuits, you're able to get sparks that when you don't see the apparatus, you don't know whether they're high frequency or static. And by certain modifications, you can even get these sparks to be DC, uh, just based on certain geometries of the circuit. And for reference, here is typical static sparks from a, a generator. We have a 24-plate Tepler-Holtz machine. Uh, these are about 15-inch discharges. And they're from a static electric machine, originally used for therapy and later used for generating x-rays in towns that didn't have power. One of the fun things we do at the museum is, is charging people with static electricity. This image of my friend Astrid was actually front page on BBC.com for a few days for an article they were doing on Victorian medicine and electrotherapy. We've also done a lot of demonstrations for schools and kids, and here we're showing how electricity can be passed through the body to light lamps, or even a series of lamps. We work often here with the South Florida Science Center and Aquarium, uh, which is a great organization locally that gets kids involved with science and STEM programs and this sort of thing. For Halloween, uh, they had the local uh, museum had a bodies exhibit, and we decided to put on a reanimation of the Bride of Frankenstein using early Tesla coils with a bit of a twist in the plot. We, uh, we decided to blow up pumpkins as well, all using Tesla coils with sparks passed through the human body.
Here's our friend Amanda, charged with 250,000 volts from the static machine. Here's Tess. Here's Lauren, a local belly dancer and performance artist. We've done several photo shoots at the museum. And here's Sam from Salty Dog Paddle. And this is my daughter, Madeline. She enjoys the Tesla coils and the static machines. Here's a picture of Jim in his lab, Jim Hardesty on the right, and on the left, the great scientist Jim and Ken Corum walking down the hall with him. We were at a Tesla lecture on Long Island for the 150th anniversary of Tesla's birth. Bill Wysock brought this priceless two-phase induction motor there that he had found. Well, we both saw it on eBay, and it was coincidentally in Ithaca, a few blocks from where Jim had lived. And Bill flew there and hand-delivered it back to Los Angeles, to Monrovia, where he lived. Uh, this is our friend Dave Archer. Dave's known as a Star Trek artist. Uh, amazing man and that he does these beautiful paintings of, of the solar system by airbrushing the moons and then painting the nebulas with a couple of million volts from this Tesla coil that originally Bill Wysock designed for him. Uh, he's a very unique artist in what he does. Many know about the sci-fi legend Kenneth Strickfadden from Universal Studios. I've replicated quite a few of his devices and through Bill Wysock have original Tesla coils that were uh, in Ken's early collection. Uh, Bill knew Ken and Ken worked at Universal with Dick Arant and John Foster. And when Ken died, John Foster ended up with the Tesla coils. He gave them to Bill and Bill gave them to me. This is a Tesla induction motor I made for the museum in Las Vegas. It was featured in a few TV shows. Uh, it's not perfect, but I only had two weeks to make it from the point that they contacted me. It was used on the National Geographic show American Genius. Most people think of Tesla and Edison when they think of people involved with early lighting, but the true credit goes to Francis Hoxby. Hoxby in the early 1700s made not only an electrical machine, but he was experimenting with uh, vacuum apparatus originally de devised by von Goerich in the late 1600s. And he was making electrical machines and many of them contained mercury. And he noticed when static and mercury were combined in a vacuum, you could make a machine that would generate artificial light bright enough you could read by. This next tube is a replica of a Sir Humphrey Davy tube where he proved that even with high vacuums in the 1800s that if there was mercury vapor present, eventually you could light it with enough voltage. And back then they were using Sprengel pumps where there was always a little bit of residual mercury vapor in the lamps no matter how high they evacuated them. Now, Hoxby would have seen a purple glow inside of his static machines. This particular glow is typical from what Tesla was doing in his lectures. This wasn't inside of a ball or with a vacuum. It was at normal atmospheric pressure. However, what Hoxby was seeing in the early 1700s was this glow basically under vacuum. This is a replica I built of one of Kinraid's machines and this machine was perfect also for producing these bright purple glows. And it mistakenly led Kinraid to believe that x-ray burns were not caused by x-rays, but rather the electricity from the machines that were uh, supplying the tubes with energy. And with a coil like this, you, you can get RF burns pretty easy, even though you don't feel the shock from them. Uh, the corona, and specifically the nitric generated by them, uh, can be quite hazardous to the skin in great exposures. This is an example of uh, 
vacuum tube, a Crookes tube with a low vacuum where you're still able to focus the energy uh, inside of the tube. They notice that if you focus the rays on a platinum disc, you could heat it up. This is Geisler's house in Germany. Geisler was the most famous glass blower uh, in making experimental lamps. A lot of these lamps at that home are replicas made by Lutz Neumann. The tube in the right hand picture in the middle is an electric egg, which was an early version of lamp made in the mid 1800s. This is a classic example of Geisler tube. The middle glass is uranium oxide glass, which gives that familiar lime green glow from the UV generated in the discharge. These lamps were largely decorative and also kind of were status symbols for the rich to own back in that time period. They were made in many shapes and sizes, as can be seen in the next slide. And they were not only a kind of scientific novelty at the time period, uh, they also formed the basis of the next set of tubes, which were studying basically vacuum discharges and how electricity works in a vacuum. And as the vacuum gets higher and higher, what happens and how things change. can't have a Tesla lecture with, about vacuum discharges without showing an electrodeless Tesla lamp. This was made by Lutz Neumann. It contains neon and will light up from 10 to 12 feet away from most Tesla coils. It's classically what Tesla would have shown in his lectures, though he would have put a name like Zmai, the famous poet, instead of his own. This tube on the left I saw in Prague when I donated the Tesla coil there in 2003. The Narodny Technitsky Museum uh, showed me their archive. And it was one of the most elaborate geyser tubes ever made in the form of a crown. And Lutz Neumann visited there shortly after I was and actually took plans to make the lamp and he was able to replicate it and Frank commissioned him to make several of those crowns. This is an early Crookes tube with phosphorescent minerals inside. And what Crookes noticed is that whether you have ultraviolet striking the minerals or cathode rays, they would light up. He also noticed if you put a physical object in a tube, in this case a cross, powered up the tube, that the cross, because the rays move in straight lines, would cast a shadow on the far end of the tube. And the light generated at the end from stressing the glass, in this case soda lime glass, would there would be a persistent glow that lasted even when the lamp was turned off. Crooks also found that you could move a small vein inside of a, a tube and it could happen under two conditions, one with a very high vacuum and the other with no vacuum at all if the tube was electrified. The tube also didn't require electricity in that if one side was painted black and the other side remained light colored, the veins would spin by themselves just in the sunlight. And the Crookes radiometer was a favorite invention of Nikola Tesla. This is a Crookes railway tube where by changing the polarity on the tube you could force a, a mechanical fan to move either left from the left to the right or right to the left inside of a vacuum. And they painted this fan with phosphorescent uh, paint made from the minerals seen in the earlier tubes and it would make a beautiful effect as it was spinning through the, the tubes. They did some novelties like putting men and lamps and or uh, roosters, flowers, different objects inside of 
these tubes and painting them different colors. The tube on the right is a ploy tube, which similar to the earlier Maltese cross tube showed that the rays move in perpendicular directions and can be used to cast shadows on the inside of the bulb. We have the Tesla lamp on the left. On the right is something called an Ebert lamp. And it was an, a lamp where electrodes were on the outside of the bulb and capacitively coupled to phosphorescent object in the middle of the bulb. So it was very similar to the lamps Tesla was making, uh, just a little bit different. This is a canal ray tube, which had perforations in the cathode inside of the tube. And there, no matter how high you get the vacuum, there's still some residual gas inside of the tube. And these are basically heavier positive ions that form this pink glow inside of the high vacuum. And they're, they, end up going through the perforations. This next tube shows the persistence of nitrogen. And when you put a discharge inside of nitrogen, there's a slight yellowish glow inside of the tube while it's operating. And depending how long you operate it and how much this gas becomes excited, when you turn off the power to the bulb, the glow remains persistent. You can see on this slide, there's there's an, a yellow afterglow, and it remains anywhere from five to 10 seconds, depending on how long the tube's energized and how much current's used. But the same principle you can see in, for example, heat lightning in the sky, you'll, you'll see these this kind of afterglow. This next tube was an experiment of Rantgen. He had been working close with Ader and Valenta studying ultraviolet, and he wanted to see if ultraviolet radiation was given off by a high vacuum tube. So what he did, he put the tube inside of a cardboard box where none of the light could come out of it. And he went across the room to pick up a fluorescent uh, screen that he had to see if it would glow when he brought it near the tube. But when he got there, as he reached down for it, he saw the shadow, his hand cast on a, the piece of fluorescent uh, screen that was already glowing. And he knew that the screen shouldn't have been glowing, that all the rays were blocked, and that there must have been something else happening. And it led to the accidental discovery of a new kind of ray that inspired the world greatly in the years that followed. This is an early x-ray tube from Germany from around 1896, and it still functions today, as you can see. This is another early tube of German design from the company Pressler. Uh, incidentally, Lutz Neumann, uh, the glass blower I mentioned before, is working in the original building that, that Pressler used to work at in the early 1900s. The, the town was uh, famous for glass blowing. Uh, early on, they made Christmas ornaments, and then later, Crooks radiometers and Geisler and Crooks tubes. Now you saw on the other tubes, they were all glowing this bright yellow green color. This tube's glowing white, and that's because it's made of a different glass. This is a bohemian crystal. 
and it phosphoresces a white color. If the tube were made from Pyrex or modern glass, it would phosphoresce a kind of bluish color. This next tube is extremely special. It was made by a company, Green and Bauer, and um, both men actually died within a few years of the company forming from complications of overexposure to x-rays. This was common by early tube manufacturers because most of them tested the, their tubes using uh, a live technique of looking at the bones of their own hand through a fluoroscope. This is a rare form of high frequency tube that was used by early x-ray machines that employed Tesla coils. This next picture shows a similar tube operating where the vacuum is too low. And instead of the green glow, you see a very faint glow and a bit of a blue discharge. That's what, when they refer to the tube as becoming gassy, this is what happens. It basically outgasses inside of the tube and you end up with a vacuum too low to produce x-rays. It starts to become more like a Geisler vacuum. This is a picture of a tube showing the polarity wired in reverse. And typically, the hemisphere that's dark in this tube should be the one that's light. And this tube, though it's producing scattered x-rays, is not producing x-rays clear enough to make a, a picture or a proper radiograph. And the reason is the x-rays are being accelerated in the wrong direction, and all the strange glows you see are these rays hitting other objects in the tube. This tube here, you see quite a lot of the rays in both directions. It's what happens when there's something called inverse discharge happening inside of the tube. And that happens with induction coils. And induction coils, when they operate, the interrupters make and break. And as a result, when the contacts touch, the coil generates a small polarity in one direction, and when they separate, it generates a larger polarity in the opposite direction. And for x-ray work, you have to get rid of the polarity in the wrong direction to be able to accelerate the electrons properly inside of the tube. This is a static discharge again, showing positive on one side and negative on the other. With static machines, they don't have the inverse discharge that induction coils do. And the reason that these coils do that is because of how the core is energized and then the polarity that the coil generates when the core collapses, when it's not energized. A simple solution to this is putting a small spark gap in series with the tube that's the length of the voltage generated by the make of the circuit as opposed to the break. These are examples of mercury interrupters that were in Frank Jones' collection. And this induction coil, a beautiful photo by a friend Ingo, uh, you can see the, the tube actually operating correctly here. The tubes, not all x-ray tubes are operating correctly, even though they appear to be. And the only way you can tell is by making a radiograph or using the fluoroscope. And unfortunately, that's how many physicians uh, ended up dying or being overexposed to the x-rays and developing cancer later on. This tube is an oscilloscope tube where two wires are in a Geisler vacuum very close to each other. And the negative wire lights the brightest. Now, in this first picture, you see an induction coil with a lot of inverse discharge where there's negative electricity present on both wires. When you add a small spark gap to the circuit, what happens is that you get rid of that inverse discharge and all the polarity is on one side. 
if you put this in series with an x-ray tube and this is what you're seeing chances are the x-rays if the vacuum is proper in the tube will be good this next picture shows a tube designed specifically for alternating currents but especially for Tesla coils and what you see on this one the cathode in the middle is basically shaped like a V and because the polarity is constantly reversing between cathode and anode for the AC waveforms or oscillatory waveforms uh, you actually generate two rays on alternating sides of the tube and you're able to make an x-ray with alternating currents even though the tubes work better from DC this tube is running from AC currents from a kinraid coil and there's a special cone inside of the tube that takes the extra alternation and focuses it in a small area in the back of the tube where it doesn't interfere with the radiograph this is an early Edison x-ray tube from Frank Jones collection extremely rare but I had the privilege of seeing it operate in person Edison's assistant Clarence Daly was the first martyr to the x-ray people know of the battle of the currents but Tesla and Edison were also battling to make a new form of lamp after the x-ray discovery both of them were trying to employ x-rays to make light and Tesla used his single wire lights and phosphorescent bulbs and Edison was coating his x-ray tubes with a phosphor trying to find the brightest phosphor to make the most efficient light and his assistant Clarence Daly in trying so many substances was exposing himself to the rays and he ended up getting amputated fingers hands eventually his whole arm and he died shortly after and it scared Edison so much he stopped working with x-rays well, the next person here is a rather eccentric inventor Frederick Finch Strong now I mentioned he had witnessed x-rays at Kinraid's house in 1896 the most powerful x-rays at the time you could see the entire human skeleton in a fluoroscope with Kinraid's apparatus and Strong began experimenting with x-rays after seeing an article Edison published during that previous time period of the battle with Tesla saying that he cured a blind patient with x-rays what he didn't disclose is that they actually had a cyst over their eye that was killed by the x-rays and that they weren't actually born blind but it led strong to experiment with a blind patient of his using a bunch of different tubes trying to see if he could cure her of blindness and while he didn't cure her of blindness she remarked that she suffered migraines frequently and every time she went to him for a treatment the migraines went away and Strong's only explanation was because he was using tubes of all different vacuums and sizes and types the only consistency was that he was running them all from a small Tesla coil so this led him to develop tubes designed for Tesla coils to apply the currents to the body and it was the earliest form of therapeutic Tesla coils these tubes were made by the thousands in the 1920s and were popular by so many companies I've documented over 50 companies in the US that made this type of apparatus and they continued in England Europe Australia around the world and they still make them today typically they're used by estheticians for treating skin conditions and getting rid of acne and that sort of thing this is an early bulb by Cooper Hewitt Peter Cooper Hewitt and he's given credit for the invention invention of the fluorescent light uh, Moore was also an early inventor for this type of light uh, originally uh, it had several pounds of mercury in it this is one of maybe three of them that still exist uh, the only known photo I know of actually one operating I operated it briefly in the museum but it was so fragile I didn't want to risk operating it any further uh, 
eventually quartz was used as the glass because these tubes operated at very high temperatures and when soft glass was used they were prone to cracking and breaking something you wouldn't want if, especially if it had two pounds of mercury inside uh, this is an alpine sun lamp from Hanovia and this is a lamp from Peter Cooper Hewitt known as the UV arc lamp and these produce extremely large amounts of UV radiation they're extremely dangerous but they were the earliest commercial lamps that were used to study UV for treating skin conditions in addition to sterilizing water and food and other applications that UV is typically used for today a man named Cromeyer had the idea of water cooling the lamps because they got so hot and what they found is he was able to get different wavelengths of UV that the other open air or air cooled lamps weren't able to produce these next slides show many prototype UV lamps all of different designs uh, Frank Jones found them on eBay and the curious thing they had a lot of trouble sealing electrodes in the quartz glass so quartz is the best glass for transmitting UV especially at the shorter wavelengths and they didn't devise a wire which is kind of a molybdenum tungsten alloy that they use today they didn't find the wire with the same coefficient of expansion as quartz until much later so these lamps were extremely expensive to make the one in the middle had 14 types of glass from the quartz to the electrode at the end of the glass where the wire was sealed in each glass having a slightly different coefficient of expansion to be able to go from quartz to soft glass and in this case it was uranium oxide glass was the, the final glass where the wire was sealed in these tubes here it's a display that I made each one contains a different gas mixture and these were used initially for visual light spectroscopy in the early days uh, they were known as spectrum tubes Plucher was one of the first people to employ them uh, and they noticed when they formed a capillary section of glass in the middle the light was concentrated and using a spectroscope they could study what wavelengths of light were produced by the different gases it's one of the ways they studied astronomy and what stars are made of uh, this tube on the right is a very early tube from the late 1800s the other ones are modern tubes now by operating these tubes from low currents and looking through them with a spectroscope you can see exactly which wavelengths of light they're produced the lights represented by bands from red orange yellow green blue violet etc and the brightness of the bands indicates the intensity at which those wavelengths are produced today and especially since the outbreak of COVID-19 there's been an increased interest in the ultraviolet wavelengths also produced by different gases and while the visual light aspects have been studied for a long time the ultraviolet light given off by the different discharges different gas mixtures different pressures is all something relatively new though there were pioneers back in the early 1900s that were doing it and probably much better than we are today uh, there's still areas in the field that can be expanded upon and improved upon this is a patent model I filed earlier this year for a new type of UV lamp and instead of using gases for the 
UV mixes. This is using different elements in combination with each other, different metals. And every metal, whether it's in a vacuum or in open air, and depending on which airs are present around the metals, emits not only visual light, but ultraviolet light. We know today most welding arcs produce UV, and operators of welders know they have to be aware of that. But whether you strike a welding arc or have a capacitor discharge arc from a Tesla-type apparatus, they all produce different wavelengths of UV. And the operating characteristics of the electricity used greatly affects which wavelengths are produced and which ones are enhanced or heightened by the different electrical supplies. This is a meteorite that I originally began this research with. Over the course of the past year, I've documented over 120 combinations of elements and what type of UV spectra they produce when used with this prototype. I hope you've enjoyed this small presentation. Uh, there's a lot of history, a lot of obscure history that's there but also some ideas that a lot of this old technology still has new areas, new fields, and new methods by which they can be explored.